Hello, and welcome to Encapsulation Tools for Rapid Product Development, presented by Pharmaceutical Outsourcing and sponsored by Capsigel. My name is Tamlin Oliver. I'm a managing editor at Compare Networks, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. As you all know, moving a compound from proof of concept through clinical studies is challenging. One way to simplify early studies is the use of specialized capsules and encapsulation techniques. In this webinar, Capsigel scientists will review specialized capsule approaches and share their best practices as well as present case studies demonstrating key aspects of these technologies. Before we begin, though, I want to remind you that we will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question at any time using the Q&A box on your screen. Our two presenters today have extensive experience. Dr. Matt Richardson will speak first. Matt is the Manager of Pharmaceutical Business Development at Capsigel. Since joining the company over 10 years ago, he's worked with many pharmaceutical and nutraceutical companies, understand the formulation aspects of their products with two-piece hard capsules, and he has shared that expertise at numerous seminars and webinars like this one. Jeffrey Williamson will be the second speaker. He's Director, Formulation and Pre-Formulation Development at Capsigel. Jeff and his team are responsible for drug substance characterization, drug product formulation, and process development. He has worked in the pharmaceutical industry for over 22 years. Uh, Matt, let's get this webinar started. The floor is yours. Great, Tamlin. Thanks very much, and thank you to everyone out in the audience for joining us today's webinar. Today, Jeff and I want to present to you several proven methods of accelerating the formulation development process using various encapsulation techniques and strategies. It's no secret that in our business, time is money. So finding ways to shorten the development pathway not only gets a formulation to a patient in need faster, but it also is instrumental strategy for cost savings simultaneously. You can see an overview of the different methods and technologies that we'll be discussing today on this slide. And we encourage you to ask questions about the content covered during the session at the end of the webinar as well. So today's webinar is aimed at one of the four core technology platforms that Capsigel has in its portfolio of solutions for customers. Encapsulation technologies that support and promote rapid advancement of products through the development pipeline. We offer several other technology platforms as well, such as targeted delivery, bioavailability enhancement, and a host of specialized applications for focused areas, like pediatrics or inhalation, for example. Each of the technologies that we want to present to you have been rationally designed and developed to provide benefits across the life cycle of the product, from early formulation development to commercial manufacture. We continue to add to the technologies that we have to offer by collaboration with our customer partners in response to the evolving needs of the pharmaceutical industry. You can see the topics we've chosen for today's discussion are really aimed at time saving and problem solving in more of the early phases of development. But what we will discuss is part of a much broader offer that actually covers the wide expanse of product development. That offer covers not only broad brush, brush applications like encapsulation technologies, but also specialized applications where in-house expertise enables us the opportunity to collaborate with our customer partners to provide better innovative solutions for the healthcare industry. I'd like to start our discussion with describing a specialized encapsulation toolkit offered for expediting development. Most preclinical and early clinical phase programs start in a capsule due to just simply the powder and capsule and direct fill formulation techniques are able to help us gather data quickly and efficiently. One of the most critical ways to affect product advancement, which is actually often overlooked, is to reduce effort duplication by a thoughtful, logical assessment of the critical parameters of the formulation. Knowledge of those critical parameters enables us, as well as understanding the desired route of administration, really enables us to match that area of potential issue with tools that provide protection. There's a myriad of application type encapsulation tools, as you can see on the right side of the slide. 
which not only provide protection of the formulation, but also enhance the formulation's probability of success. The choice of the right capsule polymer is extremely helpful in streamlining development. So in this chart, you can see a few very important capsule polymers that have proven essential for early R&D studies, including a relatively new enteric HPMC offering that I'm going to spend some more time uh, later to discuss in detail. Included in this chart are several of the most important physicochemical factors corresponding to each of the capsules as well. And these factors are almost always considered when choosing the best polymer, as they are paired with the critical properties of the formulation that we talked about previously. So if you take a look at the gelatin coning staff, for instance, gelatin has been around for several years, and so it's a proven technology able to take it forward. But sometimes we need to look at alternative polymers, like the CAPS Plus HPMC, to address critical issues. And in fact, I actually see HPMC in many cases becoming the preferred polymer of choice to begin to eliminate some of the issues that you see in the laboratory early on. And then the enteric HPMC as well. So we consider lots of different things, but consider the desired re uh, release profile, for instance. It's actually essential for the product to be immediate release, or is it a molecule that it needs protection of acid? Or take, for example, the idea of a molecule that's really sensitive to moisture. Knowing that critical attribute alone allows us to choose HPMC as the base polymer, given its comparatively low water content. Pair that polymer base with the appropriate application capsule, and you've got a dosage form that helps protect the formulation during clinical trials, instead of simply delivering. So in this section, let's take a deeper dive into the preclinical and clinical tools that have been developed and successfully used to streamline early formulation efforts. While there are a host of options available, I really want to highlight three of them in particular. The first specialized application capsule to consider are PC caps. PC capsules allow for encapsulated formulation to be dosed in rodent studies. These are size 9 capsules by comparison to standard powder filled types, and roughly 10 to 15 can easily fit on a small coin like a dime. In the upper right side of the slide, you see how even uh, the size compares to a, a standard paper clip. They're just that small. So these capsules are used typically with API alone to dose the animal so as to bypass formulation time and get proof of concept results quickly and efficiently. In addition to API and a capsule, though, they've actually been used to house a variety of formulation types, such as semi-solids and liquids, in addition to simple blend powders, with the added benefit of taste and odor masking as well. They can be modified to achieve enteric or targeted release if that is desired as well, making them a powerful tool in the rapid advancement of early formulation work. The next specialized capsule uh, are to take a look at are DB caps. DB caps capsules have a unique shape compared to the traditional capsule used for solid dose encapsulation. The body and the cap have been designed with a shorter length and a wider diameter. So there's a two-fold benefit to the design in that the capsule was made shorter so it's easier to swallow, while the increased width can actually accommodate greater than 90% of the marketed products that are out there. The cap has been designed to fit much longer over the body of the capsule, making it difficult to get into the capsule to break the blind and nearly impossible to do so without visual evidence that it's been tampered with. The globally acceptable colorants used in the capsule shells allow for complete binding of the product contained inside and allows for a wide range of oral dosage forms to be compared easily. Use of DB caps actually eliminate the need to have identical placebo matching products made and negates costly labor-intensive operations like debossing or other identification or removal processes that tend to add to the development and data generation parts of the, of the uh, timeline. As a complement to the DB caps, there's a sizing guide that allows for rapid selection of the most appropriate size of DB caps needed for a project. They come in eight different sizes and are most commonly used. DB caps are available in either gelatin or HPMC um, polymers to accommodate any formulation changes that might require aid.
Next is the all-color capsule. The concept of the all-color capsule is actually revealed in its name. So it's a capsule that contains multiple colorants and is available in two different types, one containing only global colorants and the other containing the most common FD&C colorants that are accepted by the major regulatory agencies. The power of the all-color capsule is really the strategy and the ability to move forward with the stability studies in absence of a final choice of color and ink. So quite often, final commercial design yet to be determined when it's time for stability studies to begin. The all-color capsule allows for these studies to proceed in such a situation that the formulation is exposed to dyes during stability, and then unneeded ones are simply dropped from the final formulae when the color has been chosen. And regulatory-wise, the lowering or the removal of dyes is perfectly acceptable, doesn't require additional studies or filing to achieve. So the next section takes a look at a relatively new series of tools available to advance formulation and critical data generation studies of early clinicals and can actually easily be extended in the commercial phase as well. Intrinsically, enteric capsules provide the benefit of protection without having to go through coating of the capsule to achieve the benefits. Both compounds, which are acid-sensitive compounds and compounds that can irritate the stomach, are very well suited for intrinsically enteric capsules. Historically, the need for an enteric dosage form required the use of functional coatings to achieve the benefit of acid protection. Both early clinical development and even late stage to commercial batches can be slowed by this process due to the time needed to develop, optimize, and validate the coating process. In early stages, the amount of API needed to develop multiple prototypes to fine tune the necessary performance as well as the process of developing the prototypes itself adds substantial burden both in time and cost to the project. The additional processing steps of coding for enteric protection slow the process down during manufacture of the product and add significant potential for reduced yields as well. The use of a delayed or an intrinsically enteric capsule can greatly reduce development time and contribute to the cost reduction as well. Rather than going through additional processing steps required for coatings, the formulation can simply be then added to a capsule which contains delayed or enteric properties built into the capsule without reliance on additional functional coatings. And here we ha highlight three different uh, types of delayed or enteric release capsules. So three options exist uh, as we're shown here in the table. The R caps are first, and they provide roughly a 25-minute protection, followed by a release of product slowly in acidic environments. Studies show about a 15 to 20% release of API in two hours at pH 1.2, and these are, are made of components acceptable to both the pharmaceutical as well as the health and nutritional industries. When a true enteric protection, as defined by pharmacopoeial standards, is required, though, the VCAP enteric capsule is an off-the-shelf, ready-to-use option that provides protection against acidic pH with less than 10% release of the product after two hours and has been demonstrated successful with a high range of different compounds. The VCAP's enteric capsules are two-piece hard capsules which conform to a standard encapsulation sizes for all powder fill capsules. They're made by a thermogelation process from a combination of HPMC and enteric cellulosic materials, which have been used within the pharmaceutical industry for over 20 years. So there's no concern of introducing a new or untested material. You can see that the performance of the VCAP's enteric capsule in the graph when the two-stage test protocol is applied. Compliant with all major pharmacopoeia, less than 10% release of the product is found after two hours in gastric pH while a quick release is achieved when the capsule is added to a higher pH buffer in the second stage. It's really important to note that the VCAP's enteric capsule does not require a, any additional sealing or banding to achieve that enteric performance. And this ensures that maximum compliance with pharmacopoeial requirements with minimal processing steps. We know, however, that some compounds require even further protection against acidic 
uh, media. And that's where our last tool, the intrinsic drug delivery system, comes into play. The intrinsic drug delivery system is available under licensing and guarantees a 0% release at two hours in acidic media. So depending on the characteristics of the molecule, there are a few different options to partner it to provide the best protection. So just to reiterate some of the benefits, uh, the use of intrinsically enteric capsules significantly reduces risk and time devel of development involved for acid-sensitive formulations. By removing that coating process altogether, both variability of the process and scale-up issues are minimized while providing high yield and allowing for faster development and advancement to clinical trials as well as commercial manufacture. By removing the development and the additional processes that coatings contribute, that amounts up to about nine months of potential savings alone for phase one clinical trial and up to 14 months through phase three alone. So nine months and 14 months, fairly, fairly large savings when you think about the development timeline, both in time and of course the cost as well. The next method of accelerating product development is one that might be considered an underutilized but still significant method. Liquid-filled hard capsule technology allows for the utilization of off-the-shelf capsules and solubility-enhancing formulations to provide sol solutions for a host of challenging molecules found in formulation development today. Part of the rapid advancement qualities of the liquid-filled hard capsules is the flexibility of the dosage form itself. These capsules are, can contain liquid actives for direct encapsulation, liquid formulations including SEDs and SMEDs types, even formulations which require uh, temperature elevation like thermosetting and thixotropic formulations. Even high temperature fills can easily be accommodated with the choice of an HPMC polymer liquid filled hard capsule. And this flexibility makes it quite versatile and enables the formulator to get challenging molecules to the clinic efficiently even if a different solid oral dosage form is the ultimate goal. There are a few other points when you're considering the flexibility and time-saving qualities of liquid-filled capsules. So actives which require solubility or bioavailability enhancement or prime targets for this technology, given the solubilizing effect of many liquid excipients available today. And this makes it easier to get to the clinic faster than traditional means. Highly potent actives find great benefit as well, considering the reduction of dusting and inhalation safety challenges typical with these formulations. Banding or sealing of the liquid-filled hard capsule further ensures that a capsule remains secure after manufacture for downstream processing and handling. The flexibility of dosing is another important attribute. In dose escalation and similar studies, increasing dosage is as simple as moving up a capsule size. So from the graphic on the slide, you can see the approximate volume from a size 5 capsule up to a size triple zero. And this can vary dosing from a tenth of a milliliter up to 1.3 mils. Scale up is simplified as well. So moving from just a few capsules in early clinicals to larger volumes in subsequent clinical trials really requires a minimal downtime or scale up requirements as the formulation and the process remains the same, only the batch size is increased. This approach is great in early clinicals as well when only minimal amounts of API are available. It's only small quantities are actually necessary for development activities and troubling issues with polymorphisms nullified as well. Low dose actives are perfectly suited for liquid formulation techniques as formulation uniformity is easily attained and maintained when the API is solubilized. Dosing technology being what it is today allows for high precision with extremely low relative standard deviation so that capsule to capsule and batch to batch uniformity is achieved quite easily. Having an off the shelf capsule solution also alleviates concerns of batch production minimums that sometimes force advancement to clinic to slow down while awaiting a certain amount of API to be made 
and which also subsequently drive up the cost of clinical manufacture. So here we want to highlight a, a case study that demonstrates the rapid advancement capabilities possible of a liquid-filled hard capsule technology. So a client had a fast-track development of an NCE molecule to prepare for a phase two clinical trial for C. diff. Using the technologies described in previous slides, two strengths of the clinical trial material was prepared alongside a matching placebo and a blended comparator product were manufactured and ready for use in less than 12 months from project initiation, ultimately leading up to a successful clinical trial by the client. And you can see that timeline on the right side. That project initiation was really taking a look at the first quarter, formulation development stability through mid-year, and that enabled a successful production run. Um, so the entire run was done from concept to actual manufacture in less than 12 months for the trial. Now, interestingly enough, in the formulation development, both powder formulation and liquid formulations were considered. While both were proven to be viable formulations, ultimately the liquid formulation was chosen due to several different factors, including protection of the hygroscopic API, a reduced excipient load in the liquid formulation, a high content uniformity more easily achieved in the liquid formulation, and the speed of development at which each of these factors attributed to. So the table on the right speaks to the benefits found in liquid-filled hard capsule technologies across formulation development, production, and even the sales and marketing aspects associated with product development. Perhaps of special importance are the ways in which liquid-filled hard capsule technologies are able to provide benefit to molecules which provide very unique challenges within the industry. So with that, I think I'm going to turn the remainder of the presentation over to my colleague Jeff for his insights on a few other further strategies to advance formulation development. Jeff, all over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, and once again, thanks everybody for joining us today. Now that you've seen an overview of the versatile capsule presentations and the liquid fill hard capsule technology, I'm going to be presenting applications with microdosing as a strategy to accelerate product development. Microdosing essentially is precision weighing of materials such as drug substance, blends, or other formulations into capsules. The initial concept was to deliver API as a single component. However, over the years, development teams in the industry have been creative with dispensing blends, granules, and other formulations with this approach. As depicted to the right, depending on the material physical formulate, excuse me, depending on the material physical characteristics, doses as low as 100 micrograms can be encapsulated with minimal variance in weight using Excelidose technology. Typical capsule cell, a capsule size range from size four to size double zero. So depending on the size and the composition, whether it be gelatin, B caps, or enteric caps, we now have the ability to expeditiously screen an API's performance in one of the simplest dosage forms available. Pattern capsules give us an ability to select promising API candidates from a larger portfolio without major investments for timing and expense. So some of the benefits for API and capsule target some key areas. As mentioned, an extensive portfolio of compounds may require some initial screening before investments of time and money are applied. Significant expenses are incurred with manufacturing APIs. Therefore, it's essential for the drug product development arena to provide some cost-conscious alternatives, such as powder and capsule, to streamline efforts. In a typical project plan of drug product development, there are demands on API quantities for analytical method development efforts, excipient compatibility studies, initial experimental evaluations of formulations and process. A powder and capsule approach can be very useful jumpstart to dosage form development by minimizing the usage of API. The API can be encapsulated, used for analytical assessments, even placed on stability while other aspects of drug product development, such as excipient compatibility, are conducted in parallel 
or in sequence of a particular program. More importantly, if the program has multiple strengths, Powder and Capsule gives you the ability to evaluate them using exactly the same precision weighing process Accelidos precision powder microdosing systems shown here have been extensively used in our organization to support preclinical evaluations and clinical trial manufacturing for a number of programs. The two primary devices currently used by our teams are the Accelidos 120S and the Accelidos 600S. The specifics to the instruments are shown here. The 120S is a small scale, manually loaded with a typical throughput of 60 to 100 capsules per hour depending on the dosing levels, API physicals, or operator speed for loading and unloading the capsules. For Accelido 600S, the throughput increases based on similar factors, dosing levels, API physicals, without the operator factor of a manual capsule loading and unloading. A typical range for this system is approximately 250 to 300 capsules per hour. These systems certainly have different throughputs but have similar operating principles. Material is dispensed through a mesh based on the dispense head. Powder is released by a tapping action of a solenoid on the dispense arm cradling dispense head. Parameters defining the tapping process, including tapping frequency, desired dispense rate, as well as the dispense head itself, including mesh hole sizes and number of holes, are selected depending on the physical characteristics of the material and the desired dose. The system accurately controls capsule weights by continuously monitoring the net weight being dispensed in real time and auto adjusting. As the weight approaches the target value, the rate of the powder delivery is reduced and then eventually stopped. So now that we have an overview of the operating principles behind Accela Dose, we can look at other factors that play a role in producing the powder and capsule dosage forms. Some of the API physical characteristics are critical and our good understanding of the powder behavior is essential for development as a whole and specifically for this unit operation. Particle size distribution is very important, whereas smaller doses can challenge the system's throughput by increasing the rejection rate if particles are too large. In some cases, the physical characteristics of a development API may not be directly re representative of a physical profile of the GMP material especially if particle size and powder flow properties differ from lot to lot or from supplier, as the API synthesis routes may be in their early stages of development as well. As briefly mentioned, powder flow properties can also challenge the system. Poor flow may likely constitute in higher reject rates for smaller doses. Considering the particle size and flow, a good percentage of the APIs entering development will likely require some salt free base calculations and weight adjustments. For hydrochloride salts, the adjustment is obviously not as dramatic as a compound with a higher molecular weight salt, such as a bismesylate. Adding in all these factors, along with defined capsule volumes, can be challenging. Often the directive is, quote, no bigger than a size blank capsule. Usually that constitutes as a capsule is the right size for a patient population, so no go no higher than, say, for example, a size zero capsule. As the API physical characteristics become more defined, environmental effects can become factors as well. Hygroscopicity, light sensitivity, and handling. The Accelido systems allow for processing and low humidity controls as needed for API stability to prevent a significant amount of moisture uptake. However, driving the humidity levels too low can affect the process and promote static charges that may disrupt powder flow and encapsulation. The systems can be used in yellow light or light sensitive compounds and can even be placed in higher levels of containment for potent compounds. So combining the environmental effects in these key risk areas, API physical characteristics, ways of overcoming such things as screening or milling may be an option for controls. Reducing particle size may have an inverse effect for flow and fill volume, so fill evaluations are essential. 
some initial flow and fill evaluations can provide very valuable information for Excel of those settings, such as dispensing heads, the tapping frequencies, dispense rates, to ensure increased success levels in production. In some cases, additional excipients may be added or some densification processes may be employed, such as roller compaction, to facilitate the encapsulation process. Microdosing has been a significant part of Exelliant's operations, now fully integrated into Capsigel. This approach has allowed for experience and expertise in microdosing over 200 APIs with many different fill weights. The latest offerings and support within Capsigel allow for expedient evaluations of different capsule presentations, such as the aforementioned all-color all and enteric capsules. The Excelido systems provide initial dosage forms for fast transitions into analytical assessments to support proof of concept in clinical trials. Separate experimental Excelidos 120S and GMP Excelidos 600S operations allow for even faster assessments of API physical characteristics and encapsulation settings with minimal withdrawal from bulk inventory. Here are a few bullets from high-level view of some of the microdosing programs to date. Majority of the dosing ranges that we've experienced are from one milligram to 50 milligrams. Our smallest dose to date is 0 0.1 milligrams or 100 micrograms. Our largest dose to date is 250 milligrams. Again, all of this is based on the physical characteristics of the API. We've normally experienced low RSDs as far as the acceptable capsules are concerned, and the typical weight acceptance limits are usually between or plus or minus 5%. In this area, development evaluations are essential, especially for the suitability of fill. Will it fill in the desired capsule size? Looking at API lots physical assessments, where there's there any difference between the R&D and the GMP lots? Determining dispense head and parameters to use. What are their tapping frequencies that we could be employing on the, on the systems to provide a more accurate fill? And it certainly, and more importantly, produce capsules for analytical method de development, stability, talk studies that can really jumpstart the programs. So now I'd like to take the opportunity to present some of the case studies that we've experienced. This first case study is a challenge for low dose. The client had a high potent product needed for a low dosage for a study. The amount needed was very small, again, 100 micrograms delivered into a size one capsule. The biggest constraint with this approach was the plus or minus 5% weight, weight range with this particular dispensing activity. Several evaluations were completed in development to determine the correct dispensing head and tapping frequency. Through the development evaluations through clinical trial, the clinical deliveries were met. The yield for the low dose was approximately 46%. One could say that that is very low as far as the yield is concerned. However, with the small amount that was actually being dispensed, we were able to increase the number of capsules to be produced to provide the exact number that was needed for the clinical trials. In case study number two, for micro-dispensing a blend, reformulation of an encapsulated blend that provided 30 milligrams of API per 200 milligrams of blend. The challenge here was a one-time batch for a pediatric dose at five milligrams. This particular case, the client did not want to reformulate, specifically more stability, just for this particular purpose. We employed the Excel of those systems and use the same blend to deliver the amount that was necessary for the pediatric application. The overall outcome for this case study, we did not experience any blend segregation that you would think that would be possible with actually tapping or dispensing blends in this type of approach. Assay and uniformity of dosage units, acceptance criteria were met. And specifically, the clinical delivery date was met, savings an appreciable time of four to six months that could be certainly eaten up 
by developing another dosage form. Case study number three was a comparator assessment. The challenge is the client had an, an NCE that liked to perform against a comparator. Again, for this particular operation, the marketed product was a much larger dose than what they were seeking, and we needed to uh, evaluate how we were going to dispense a comparator using the Excel dose. By doing so, we milled the comparator tablets to create a powder blend. Using Excelados filled the capsules into the desired fill, fill weight and strength to do the comparator assessment with their NCE. Obviously, this approach would not be applicable to some of the ER systems that are out there, whether if it's a matrix tablet or an enteric coated capsule, or excuse me, tablet, because of the milling process. The capsules then met acceptance criteria for assay and uniformity of dosage units. And again, clinical delivery date was met. For case study number four, this was a proof of concept challenge for pediatric, pediatric dosage form using a sprinkle or for soft food. It was a two pellet fill. One pellet was very low dose, approximately seven to eight. And we used this particular approach to look at multiple dose combinations. The low filling weight into sachets initially, and the possibility of pellets getting trapped into that sachet and not being administered or delivered into a food source. One pellet lost in this particular application would result in a potency reduction of about 12.5%. The outcome, we were able to make a transition using the Connie Snap sprinkle caps and then help ensure the dose was accurately delivered using the Acceladose 120S to demonstrate this as a proof of concept. Within Capsigel, there are two service centers to provide microdosing services in North America at our Tampa facility and in Europe at Formel. The two centers' microdosing cap capabilities are listed here and fully support by the capsule product line from Capsigel. Analytical services are an integral part of the centers for, from initial API assessments, method development, and stability support of the programs. Additionally, pre-formulation service teams can assess not only flow and fill, but solid state characterization of incoming APIs with respect to morphology, SEM, microscopy, DSC, TGA, and a host of other applications. So in summary, we were able to see today the fit for purpose capsule and capsulation tools developed from rapid screening and advancement of promising APIs, whether through preclinical evaluations, double blind studies, all color options, intrinsically enteric technologies, liquid filled hard capsules. HPMC capsules have been shown to broaden the space for two-piece capsule application in pharmaceutical product development and certainly manufacturing. API or powder and capsule studies using Capsigel Acceladose Precision Powder Microdosing Systems offer further improvement in speed to clinic through phase two. And best practices using, using have been developed based on extensive formulation experience over a myriad of compounds. So at this point, we would like to turn it over and answer any questions that you may have. All right, actually, before we do that, we have a quick polling question. It appears on your screen right now. So if you could just take a minute and let us know if you would like Caps to Joe to follow up with you after the webinar, uh, the yes or no um, question. Um, all right, now we are uh, ready to begin the Q&A portion of this webinar. Matt, we will start with you. The first question is, 
Does the DR capsule become soft during the acid soak, and would it be physically strong to take the effects of food? Okay. Uh, yeah, interesting question. So um, the DR capsule is going to become soft in, uh, well, pretty much any any media, whatever. And that's just because the DR cap, like most other HPMCs, are going to pull water into the capsule. Um, so they're going to absorb a certain amount. And when that happens, the capsule is going to become softer. And the DR cap has a gelling agent, which is resistant to acid. And so it's a slow disintegration at that point. Uh, you're still going to get some disintegration in the stomach, for sure. Um, is it going to be robust enough uh, for food effects? Uh, it's going to be very similar to a B cap, and that's a different HPMC capsule, but uh, we have seen, we have some, done some work on B caps and uh, gelling system products with food effects and basket effects as well. And, and that's information I can send to you easier than I can tell you. Um, basically, what we see is we see a delay, we see a, a larger T lag for the V cap, and I would expect it to be substantially a bit more for the DR caps. Um, we do have some gamma centrigraphy as well on the DR cap that we could we could share with you on its performance. So um, hopefully that, that probably doesn't answer your question completely, but I think we've got enough data on hand that uh, we can we can partner with you and, and show you and alleviate some of your concerns with this or answer some of your questions. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, the next question is for you, Jeff. Have you dispensed more than one material separately using Excelodose for PIC? We have. Um, as in case study number four, we were able to de deliver a couple of different pellets that we were doing for proof of concept. Um, we've also, in development, looking at uh, more or less an API and another functional component, an antioxidant for an API that was being evaluated for animal studies where we used the 120S system and did an initial delivery of the, the uh, functional excipient and without snapping everything closed, going back and introducing the API. So um, it, yes, it can be done. Um, it's certainly laborious uh, from a on the development standpoint by since it's so manual, but it, it certainly does offer an option for um, looking at the API with uh, whether it be a functional excipient such as an antioxidant for initial screening. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Matt, we're back to you. Uh, is it necessary to seal or ban the liquid-filled hard capsule form formulations? Okay, uh, yeah, good question. And really, uh, it's it's all dependent on the formulation. If you've got something that's going to set up very fast, uh, like a thermo setting or a thixotropic, something that can't possibly leak at all, uh, then I would not be concerned about banding or sealing a capsule. If you're going to have uh, the formulation to be significantly liquid at any portion or any substantial amount of time, then we definitely recommend banding or sealing as a way to make sure that leaking is, is just a, a negligible issue for that sort of thing. All right, uh, Jeff, how many dispensing heads are available? On Excelido systems, uh, as many as, as 32 can exist in a set, um, and certainly uh, as needed, any of those dispensing heads can be customized. Again, the driver is the API physical characteristics or the material that's being filled uh, using this type of application. So as far as the quantities are concerned, as many as 32 in a set, but there's an, certainly an offering or, that can be uh, customized as these evaluations are being, um, are, are taking place. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, Matt, we're back to you. At what phase of the drug development process are comparative studies undertaken? Uh, uh, so for comparative studies, if you mean by um, comparative studies for dosage forms and things like that, those are typically done somewhere between phase one and phase two. Um, comparative studies for 
existing products that are out there that DVs that could really be at any phase. So, um, for instance, a a new product that comes onto market is typically tested against a branded product that exists already to make sure that it's going to be um, as robust or prove, provide better benefits, and that's typically undertaken somewhere between phase two and phase three. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Jeff, what is in the comprehensive documentation for Excelidose? The Excelidose systems um, have a pretty uh, pretty detailed uh, documentation as far as a run batch report that can be generated, all governed by the, uh, the or supervised by the PC. Um, in the batch reports, it's as much information as the balance information, the make, the model, calibration information, and probably the most important is the uh, the settings as far as how the material is being dispensed. And of course, the 100% weight verification of each capsule that's produced in that particular run. So it is is pretty comprehensive as far as the process is concerned. And certainly they can be revisited um, as far as uh, different lots of API are um, being introduced to look at those particular settings that were used before and can be employed for additional encapsulation endeavors. All right, uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, Matt, I now have a series of questions for you. Um, enteric coated size 9 capsules have been shown in multiple published studies that they don't empty the stomach of rats, um, 200 grams or above. Is there any data Capsigel has with capsules smaller than size 9? Uh, the only capsule, yeah, smaller than a size 9, I would say no. Um, those are typically size M capsules, and, and they're for, for mice instead of the larger rodents. Um, no, so they're coated size 9s, however. Uh, coating the size 9, it, it's always a question of thickness. So the coating process and the enteric property is related then as, as thickness. So if you've got a situation where you're not getting that, that reliance that you need, adjustment of the thick coating thickness may be the way to go. Now, we are currently working on a VCAP enteric size 9 and are working with a couple customers on their insight as far as when the capsule should and shouldn't open as far because given that, you know, the digestive system of the rat versus human, different time points altogether. So you know, we would welcome your input on that as well. And you're welcome to reach out to me directly through my email. And uh, let's, let's work on trying to get your, your question answered. We do have a white paper um, where we have talked about enteric coding size 9 capsules as well. Uh, that may be something that we could take a look at with you as well. Okay, Matt, I have another question on the enteric capsules that you spoke about. Is there any concern of the coating coming off during encapsulation or at any time during processing of the capsules? Well, okay, yeah. So uh, in a traditional coating process, the answer is yes. So when you've got a coated capsule, the thickness of the coat is always related to how fast that capsule is going to open in the gastrointestinal tract. That's why we're kind of excited with the intrinsically enteric capsule that we've discussed today is that it's not based on the coating at all. It's actually the enteric properties are built into the capsule through the use of a couple different polymers that are blended together to make the capsule. So there's no coating that could actually be scraped off with an intrinsically enteric. And so I don't expect that performance will be changed at all in a situation like that. Okay, Matt, and we have time for one final question. I think this is it. Um, you mentioned the choice of hard capsule polymers can help to protect the formulation during development and manufacturing. Can you speak to when it's appropriate to use the HPMC versus gelatin capsules? Sure. So uh, HPMC, uh, I think I alluded to this earlier. I actually see it for a long time um, 
people were so used to working with gelatin, there was a hesitancy to using some of the HPMC. I now see HPMC getting a lot more grounded within different R&D departments altogether. There's a really a host of different times that you would think it's appropriate to use an HPMC, uh, especially a moisture sensitive issue or a hygroscopic formulation, that sort of thing. Anything that can pull water away from gelatin or interact really with the water and gelatin, that's a prime target for HPMC. But uh, just as important are things like um, formulations that may be prone to cross-linking because they contain either an aldehyde somewhere in, in the mix or a reducing sugar in the formulation, something like that, or even just stability studies alone at, at accelerated can sometimes promote cross-linking. So I even see people moving to an HPMC to avoid the issue altogether. So moisture is certainly a, a key one. Avoidance of cross-linking, even thermal stability, we see uh, as another big impetus for the use of HPMC as well. So those are just three right off the top of my head. There are others we could talk about, but I think those would probably be the three biggest. Thanks, Matt. And um, that's all the time we have for questions. Any questions that we couldn't address here live will be answered by our panelists via their email. Um, please note that there's going to be a survey screen on your box in a second. It would be great if you could take a minute and give us some feedback on the webinar. Um, finally, we'd like to thank our presenters, uh, Matt Richardson and Jeffrey Williamson, for their time today and give a special thank you to Capsigel for sponsoring today's event. We'll be sending an email shortly with a link to the on-demand version of this webinar. You can watch it again or you can share it with colleagues. Thanks for attending the webinar today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next one. <laughs>